Good evening, everyone. This is Anthony with BBSN, and uh, just a quick channel announcement. And also figured uh, we'd also chat a little bit about the dead ball era, my favorite uh, era in baseball, specifically about Rube Waddell, just to kill a few minutes. But first, uh, the announcement, we uh, reached a hundred subscribers on the channel today. So first of all, I wanna give a big, uh, big thank you to everyone who has subscribed and has commented on, liked the videos. Uh, again, uh, hope the con hopefully the content that uh, I'm putting out is enjoyable. And uh, if you do have any suggestions, as always, feel free to add those. And our 100th subscriber was, uh, a gentleman by the name of Walter Solkowski. So Walter, thank you for uh, helping the channel reach that first milestone. And as I mentioned in a previous video, once we got to this point, we we're going to do a, a giveaway. So the giveaway again will be basically three, three rookie cards from the um, um, early 90s and late 80s. Uh, one, not technically his official rookie card, but his uh, actual rookie card if you go by um, the way baseball measures a rookie in terms of at-bats uh, will be Mark McGuire, a very uh, skinny Mark McGuire as you'd see on the card and uh, also uh, Mike Piazza, his upper deck rookie card and uh, David Need who was uh, projected to be a potential great, uh, never did pan out due to arm troubles and inconsistency but those three rookie cards will be in the giveaway, and uh, I did uh, post them as the cover picture for this video. So take a look at those, and if you're interested in getting in on the giveaway, uh, just drop your name in the comments. Uh, we'll give, uh, give it a couple of days to uh, get uh, a few people in there. And then uh, later on this week, we'll go ahead and complete the giveaway. And to our 100 subscriber, Walter Solkowski, uh, you, sir, are automatically entered, and thank you again for helping us reach the milestone. So, some water. <clears throat> I also wanted to uh, take a few minutes to kind of chat about one of my favorite characters from the dead ball era, Rube Waddell. And Rube, um, it's, it's debatable if he could even function in today's game. He... Uh, I guess if you had to compare him to modern sports figures, would be, jeez, uh, I don't even know. Uh, part Johnny Manziel, <laughs> part, uh, I, I really don't know if there's a good comparison for him, especially in the, in the game of baseball. Um, Waddell, many have uh, speculated about um, what caused him to be the way he was, uh, Bill James, uh, offered a, a several likely scenarios, ADHD, uh, some type of disorder in the uh, autism spectrum. And if you look at or read about some of his exploits and actions, that one would make some sense, uh, specifically Asperger syndrome, which allows people to be functional in society at various levels, but also... Um, they do so with a few eccentricities or quirks, as it may be. And if you read about that particular uh, condition, a, a lot of Rube's actions would be indicative of somebody who, uh, who had that to some type of you know, varying degree. Uh, definitely, I think it's safe to say he had some type of behavioral health disorder. Um, and, and it makes you wonder, again, for that reason, if he had existed in, in modern society if he would have even got the opportunity to play baseball outside of um, a scenario where maybe he's hurling a javelin in the uh, Special Olympics, uh, which I believe is something that Bill James mentioned when he uh, spoke about Waddell. But uh, you really would not, in different time back then too, you, you wouldn't see an athlete in today's society with social media and uh, everything going on, I mean, it would be a firestorm for any team who had a ball player like that. I mean, the stories of Waddell, one in particular, Connie Mack had at one point hired a Pinkerton detective 
to kind of trail Waddell and, and report on him. And typically those reports would follow Waddell as he made his way to the ballpark, uh, stopping at every saloon in his path to enjoy. Back in those days, I guess it was the early uh, 20th century form of happy hour where they would uh, give patrons free sandwiches to get them to uh, come in and, and partake of spirits. So uh, he, the detective would document Rube's trip, uh, indicating at times how many sandwiches he ate, how many beers he had. And uh, the story eventually ends up with Waddell had uh, become wise to this Pinkerton detective following him, and had, well, or knew all along, and had ditched him. And the detective finally caught up with Waddell and Waddell had apparently been priming the patrons of the bar he was found at um, regarding the arrival of this detective. And, and when he got there, Waddell pointed at him and said, there he is. And at that point, several of the patrons jumped the Pinkerton detective and, and gave him a, a ass kicking, basically, at the behest of Waddell. So who knows what he said to get them into that state of mind, but uh, and not necessarily a funny story. The man could have been hurt badly. Fortunately, he wasn't, uh, but bad enough to go back to Connie Mack and basically say he was done uh, with Waddell. So, but to compare that to uh, the modern age, uh, people nowadays with their camera phones and uh, YouTube, Snapchat, Facebook Live, could you possibly imagine Waddell and the fear that he would create as people filmed his exploits in that last scene with the Pinkerton detective uh, in particular? You know, people with their camera phones out would have obviously filmed everything Waddell had been saying about the guy and then filmed his beating and, you know, filmed the aftermath, which probably would include people, uh, you know, laughing and, and Waddell buying beers for everyone. Uh, so, so kind of put that into context and, and think how that would go over uh, in, the, in this current, you know, in society today. Probably not so well. Um, but many other stories about Waddell. Uh, one, one that I find funny, and, and again, to compare it to what would happen if this was a modern day scenario. Back in the dead ball era, uh, money teams were very tight with money, not only with salaries, but in terms of travel expenses. And obviously back then all the travel was done by train. Um, all the major league cities were in the Midwest to the East. And a, a Western road trip back then consisted of, you know, one of the New York teams or Boston or Philadelphia going to St. Louis, you know, that, that was a Western road trip. Um, all done aboard a train, uh, sleeping on basically what amounted to almost hammocks, and um, the uh, starters would get the bottom hammocks, they were apparently more, or bottom bunks, uh, apparently more comfortable and easier to get a, a good night's sleep in, and the reserve players would have to sleep up on top. And once they got to the cities, uh, most teams made players uh, share a room, you know, which is nothing too unusual, minus the fact that generally those rooms only had one double bed in them. So Waddell uh, had to sleep with, uh, or sleep with, room with Ozzy Schreckengost, uh, the ca catcher on the athletics at the time. And one of the complaints that Schreckengost had was Waddell would come to bed and eat animal crackers. And again, you know, a, a hotel room, and Waddell was not a small man for his time. He clocked in, um, I mean, he's roughly my size, and not that I'm big, but back then I would have been considered above average. I, I'm six foot and go around 200 pounds. And Waddell was um, six one and about 195 to 200 pounds. So I, I couldn't imagine sharing a double bed with um, somebody my size on a, in a cheaper hotel as well. They didn't stay at the best accommodations. Uh, ball players back then were still not widely accepted as uh, um, 
celebrities per se by some of the population and definitely not regarded as high class citizens that would stay in the finest digs. So Waddell would, would eat uh, animal crackers in bed and you know, Schreckengast uh, eventually went to Connie Mack to complain about it and um, indicated it was hard for him to sleep because he's constantly, you know, rolling around in Waddell's crumbs and, and waking up itchy and irritated. And on top of that, um, Waddell was nicknamed by the Sporting News the Southpaw because he was an alcoholic. And Schreckengast had sworn off the bottle at some point during his tenure with the Athletics, so that created friction between the two as well. And again, translate that to the modern era, the, the drama and the way the tabloids and the, and the current media would be all over that. Uh, and I mean, let's just take two modern players and put it in context. First of all, could you imagine the Yankees putting two players in a room with one bed and Aaron Judge and Giancarlo Stanton having to room together and, and share a single uh, double bed at, uh, you know, 6'5 and, and whatever um, Stanton goes, about 245, and, and Judge at almost 6'8 and 280. I mean, that's comical in itself. Or uh, Clayton Kershaw and... Uh, um, oh geez, Yasiel Puig uh, rooming on the road and you know Puig coming to bed every night after a ball game with a big uh, bag of Lay's potato chips. Uh, you know, just, just picture Kershaw going to uh, Davey Roberts, the Dodgers manager, to complain about Puig eating potato chips in bed because he woke up all itchy and was, was sick of smelling like sour cream and onions. You know, so that's that's kind of the, um, the uh, tough life that the dead ball players had to, to, had to put up with. And yeah, he, you know, now players stay in the best hotels. They have rooms to themselves and all the amenities you can imagine. So that obviously wouldn't happen. But kind of comical to think about how that would translate to modern day ball players. Um, you know, other things... A lot of myths about Waddell, too. He never bolted off the mound mid-game to go chase a fire engine. He, he was fascinated with fires and would often volunteer uh, or go assist fire departments in fighting fires or just go watch. But, you know, there's stories that he would hear a fire truck go by in the middle of a game and middle of an inning he's on the mound and would just bolt to go follow a fire truck. Didn't happen. And... His Wikipedia page even says that, and that's really never been substantiated by anyone who's done, you know, serious uh, research on Waddell. Um, talk to about how he would call his outfielders in and sit them down and then strike out the side uh, during games, actual games. Never happened. It did happen in exhibition games, uh, which back then ball players. Um, on the way back to their city from spring training, they'd often stop and play exhibition games along the way uh, with local teams. Teams that really, you know, weren't going to pose a, a threat to them as, you know, it would be like the San Diego Padres on their way back to California, stopping where I live here, which is on the way. And, um, playing a local men's over 30 recreational league team. You know, we're not gonna do anything to them. So uh, Luis Perdomo in that situation could probably call in his outfield and strike out the side. So that was kind of the, the um, scenario that Waddell would do that in exhibition games when the team was traveling back to Philadelphia to start the season. Uh, some, th some things that he would do, he, uh, would disappear between starts. Uh, he was a big fisherman and Connie Mack, who probably was the only manager who could have handled Waddell. I mean, I couldn't imagine him playing for John McGraw back in the day. McGraw, despite his talent, probably would have put up with Waddell for half a season. Uh, Connie Mack, on the other hand, had uh, a great deal of patience for and with Waddell and really loved Rube. His stories, you'll hear stories that his uh, 
Connie Mack's children told later in life about how when their father would speak about Waddell, it was always in glowing terms, um, which, uh, you know, shows the kind of person Connie Mack was. He, he never, to the best of anyone's knowledge, even uttered a curse word, a total gentleman. McGraw, a little bit rougher. They both played in the same era, but McGraw came from the, uh, the Baltimore Orioles, who were notorious for their antics in the 1890s, and he had that edge to him. So definitely he played for the right manager, and, and even Mack could only tolerate him for six seasons. But Connie Mack used to uh, give Rube an allowance. Uh, they never really gave him a regular paycheck. Um, Reason being is, if he had received a regular salary, he may have disappeared for weeks on end because he generally would be gone long enough for his allowance to run out to come back and get more, which Mac would kind of time to uh, um, coincide with when his scheduled starts were. So the stories there were he'd taken off, gone fishing, and was nowhere to be found. Uh, the team would get word that he had been seen in this location. There was a boat sitting out in the middle of the lake, and upon further investigation, Waddell was out there. He had fallen asleep and uh, had a boat full of fish, had beer, and a severe sunburn. Um, was definitely someone who uh, <laughs> could be... Uh, distracted by things, um, stories about when he was in Pittsburgh, opposing manager, distracted him with uh, stories of a new puppy that he wanted uh, Waddell to see. Uh, so you could get to him and throw him off uh, his game in that fashion. Uh, his talent was unmistakable. He probably was the second or third hardest throwing pitcher of that era. Um, obviously, Walter Johnson has to be considered the hardest. And um, Noodles Hahn, who pitched for Cincinnati and had two or three very successful seasons before his arm kind of blew out, was also an extremely hard thrower uh, in that era. Uh, kind of at the tail end of Amos Rusi's career as well, the uh, Hoosier Thunderbolt, who uh, had a very uh, big problem with control, but threw as hard as anybody, and he pitched primarily in in the 1890s and into the beginning of the century. So Waddell's right up there and arguably had the best curveball of the era. So when you put top three fastball with arguably best curveball, and, and Connie Mack said it, uh, he saw there was no other pitcher that he knew of or worked with in his time in the game, which spanned 50 years. And, you know, he had some great hurlers on his staff. Eddie Plank, Chief Bender, Later on, Lefty Grove, uh, Jack Coombs had one outstanding season. So that's high praise when Connie Mack says Waddell had the best combination bender and heater that he had ever seen. Uh, other things that Waddell would do, um, you know, kind of showed the, the uh, warm heart that he had as a person. He um, always was looking to volunteer, not only assisting with fighting fires, but uh, helping out with floods. He'd done that. He did that a couple of times. Uh, the second time when he was no longer in the majors, he was pitching for the Minneapolis Millers and had assisted in a flood at a town in the Midwest uh, that basically resulted in him catching pneumonia and ultimately turned into tuberculosis and led to his demise. Uh, and again, in his prime 6'1 and about 195 to 200, when he passed away in 1913, he weighed 130 pounds. Um, and again, something that would not happen and not the well, I, I shouldn't say that. Ball players these days do get involved in the community, but to the extent where Waddell is out there in frigid water, you know, filling sandbags, um, you know, it, it, he he was a rare person in any time for that that part of him. Uh, he had other shortfall shortcomings. Uh, he was not a very good husband. He had two disastrous marriages and in both cases his uh, 
spouse basically sued him for divorce for um, trying to get the phrase that was used in the divorce papers, lack of, well, basically lack of spousal support or lack of fulfilling what was expected of a, a man in a marriage at that time, which again would make sense, um, you know, given Waddell's attention span, which was not existent. Uh, he was not the kind of person to, to spend time at home and, you know, sit around, especially back in those days where they didn't have the entertainment that we do now in terms of cable TV, uh, video games, the internet, uh, what have you, Stratomatic. Um, you know, so there Waddell would basically be relegated to sitting around having to communicate with his wife and Waddell was, again, with a short attention span, was looking probably for more excitement and often lived apart from his wives and, and in both cases kind of acrimonious divorces, you know, that he just lost interest in the marriage, basically. So, you know, again, some shortcomings there. And it kind of lends credence to some of the speculation as to what had afflicted him. Um, again, the uh, a disease in the autism spectrum, such as Asperger's, uh, ADHD, um, all come into play there. But definitely an interesting character. And there's a uh, a uh, couple of good books out there on Rube uh, that I would recommend reading. Um, you know, definitely lots of anecdotes. And, and the thing with Waddell, too, is the stories that are true are actually better than some of the stories that were made up about him. But anyway, that's uh, my little brief dissertation on Rube Waddell. Uh, definitely has to be regarded talent wise and, again, comparative of talent to era and how he was dominant in his era. I mean, he struck out, I believe, 313 batters in 380-something innings back in the day. And, and in the dead ball era, that was unheard of. Even Walter Johnson never approached that strikeout to inning pitched ratio or that number of strikeouts um, because the batters approached the game different. They didn't have, they weren't up there with, uh, you know, swinging for the fences. They used um, larger bats, probably the most hitters do now with the exception of Wee Willie Keeler. Willie Keeler used the smallest bat in Major League history, uh, 30 inches, and he would even choke up on that. And the other, bat, the other batsmen would use bigger sticks, but still with uh, two strikes and even one strike, they would, they would choke up and try and place the ball, a lot more bunting, um, working to get the ball in play and advance the uh, runner playing small ball. So that in itself was not conducive to high strikeout totals. You add to the fact that, you know, most pitchers back then did not throw every pitch at maximum effort like they do now, which was a reason that so many pitchers back then were able to, uh, you know, complete 38 of 42 starts or hurl 380 innings in a single season because they didn't have the constant strain on the arm. Um, they would let up and bear down when they had to because the ball, when you're playing with one ball and it's okay to scuff it, it's not exactly a sturdy, stout ball anyway. So by the middle of the game, it's misshapen, it's soft, it's, it's stained with tobacco juice and dirt and hard to uh, really hit for any distance. So you, you could groove pitches in there and let your defense behind you do work and bear down when you had men on base, which is what a lot of hurlers did. A uh, notable exception was Walter Johnson, who was said to uh, throw every pitch, and you know his repertoire was basically two pitches, and mostly it was his fastball, but every pitch as hard as he could. And I think in Johnson's case, what saved him was uh, his throwing motion, which looked almost effortless if you watch it on film. He's just a very short sidearm motion, like he's almost slinging a uh, rock across a pond. But he could generate velocity, and Waddell was another who would throw uh, hard the majority of the time or break off his curveball. So. You know, those two were two pitchers in the era, probably two of the few that actually 
gave maximum effort on most or all of their pitches, which is why the strikeout totals were lower and which is what makes Waddell's total uh, of 313 even more impressive. But anyway, uh, enough of that. My, uh, again, little dissertation on Waddell. And uh, again, the giveaway will be coming up this week in the next couple of days. And uh, thank you again for everyone who has subscribed. And until uh, our next video, which will be the St. Louis Browns uh, 1922 Time Machine Project. Keep rolling for the fences. And again, thanks for watching. Take care.